So on tonight's webinar, we're going to discuss nutritional and fitness strategies that will help you to age with energy. And our speakers today are HSS sports nutritionist Heidi Skolnick and HSS exercise physiologist Polly DeMille. And so now we will get started with our questions. So my first question is for Heidi. Um, what would you say are the top five most important nutrients for someone to incorporate in their diet in order to adequately fuel them and um, especially as an active and aging adult? So the most important one is really protein. And that doesn't mean a high protein diet. It's just meaning that it's an adequate protein diet and especially how we distribute that protein throughout the day. We tend to really under eat protein in the morning and then have a lot of it um, for dinner. And as Polly, you know, the reason this is just so perfect that we're presenting together is, you know, after age 30, we begin to lose muscle each year, um, about 8%. So that by the time like between 40 and 60, we've really lowered our metabolism when we're breaking down protein, our, our muscle at a faster rate. Um, and so we really need to eat protein to keep that muscle protein synthesis going to try to maintain. So between diet and exercise together, it's the perfect combination. Um, I think we need calcium. We've, I think everybody here has heard that before, but it is important that we get an adequate calcium and vitamin D. B12 is a nutrient we don't absorb as well as we age. Um, it's our, our, um, our stomach changes, the, our, our ability to produce stomach acid, which we need to break that down. So that's something that we probably need to either have a lot of fortified foods or to um, supplement with. Um, and then also if you're doing more plant-based or become vegan, you, it, B12 is only found in animal protein. Um, and then I would say fluid. Fluid is actually really important. As we get older, we, our thirst receptors change and we don't realize that we're drinking less. And it's really easy to sort of walk around in this like, you know, really dehydrated, subclinical dehydration in a way, you know, just sort of chronic. And so I'd say that's, that's one we don't really think of, but it's really important. All right, great. And uh, similarly to that, Polly, what types of exercise or specific movements do you most recommend for people 50 plus looking to stay active, but also want to stay safe and not injure themselves? Um, so what I'm going to do here is just bring up a couple of slides because a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, okay, so this is... Um, if we think about sort of what types of exercise, I think it's one way to think about it is, you know, it's, it's as Heidi's talked about all these various nutrients you need, you need a variety of, of ways of exercising as well to kind of reach your goal of being fit and active and pain-free. Um, so if we think about the top of the pyramid, your goal might be, you know, being able to pick up your grandchildren or maybe it's playing golf or, you know, whatever your specific idea of what, um, you'd like to be doing physically. And in order to do that, you have to address kind of the base of that pyramid, what allows you to move well and have stamina and not be in pain when you're moving. And it's this, um, the base of that pyramid is made up of sort of these key components, first being just muscular strength. Um, the next thing would be postural alignment and balance. Are you able to, you know, maintain yourself upright? Can you have, <clears throat> do you have adequate balance to stand on one leg? Um, joint range of motion and flexibility. Just like Heidi mentioned that you lose muscle mass, you also don't exactly get more flexible as you get older. Our, our tissues tend to get a little stiffer. And so that can really um, limit your ability to do things if you're really tight. Um, cardiovascular fitness, obviously that's what gives you, besides just all the health benefits of preventing heart disease, gives you the stamina and the endurance to do the things you want to do. And then body composition is, um, you know, having adequate density and bone density, having adequate muscle mass. Um, people sort of tend to focus on percent body fat where, you know, that is obviously, you know, what <clears throat> one component, but in terms of health, I'm much more interested in people having adequate bone strength and muscle mass than the percent body fat they have. So all those things kind of come together to allow you to move with speed or to run or to, you know, catch yourself when you fall or to get out of the way of a, you know, bicycle that's coming down the street quickly and also allows you to do whatever it is you want to do in life um, 
that is your particular goal. So if we think about those different components, you know, there's no necessarily one best exercise, but there are lots of exercise in each one of those buckets. Um, so if we go to, oops, let's see. Uh oh, <laughs> I can't get to the next slide. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, so here we go. This is just an example of simple something you can do at home, which is just a strength training exercise for the legs and the glutes and the core. You're just doing a squat. Um, so that's a perfectly, you know, that exercise can be done in a chair for somebody who's just beginning or it can be done holding heavy weights for someone else. Here's a hip bridge, which is just to strengthen the glutes. Again, you don't need special um, equipment to do this. You just need to get down and keep your core tight and lift your hips up to strengthen the hips. Um, but if you're, you know, if this is too easy, you do it on one leg or you do it with a dumbbell across your hips there. So there's really no end of variation. This is an exercise a row just to strengthen your upper back. Um, and you can do this in a gym with a pull down machine or a row machine, or you can do a pull up, you can do with tubing, but it's a basic, you know, exercise, push, pull. Um, and here's a push exercise. You can do this off a wall on a countertop, down on the floor. Um, so there's really no, you know, there's millions of variations, but some very fundamental movements. So just pushing, pulling, sitting, standing, standing on one leg. And then as far as stretches, depending on where you're tight, there's a million ways to stretch and you just kind of want to address those areas in which you feel limitations. And here's just a simple exercise of stretching your chest with a towel. And then finally, a balance exercise. This is, you know, just getting something out of the refrigerator, doing it standing on one leg. So again, none of this stuff has to be really fancy or require a ton of equipment, but you just want to kind of think about, are you addressing all the components that are going to allow you to reach whatever your fitness goal is? Are you looking, are you working on your strength, your mobility, your cardiovascular fitness, your balance, and your body composition? So that's kind of the, um, the thing to think about as far as what types of exercise, those would be the types of exercise. So it's a varied diet of exercise. And then as far as the ones to stay, you know, specific exercises to stay safe, it's really where are you at? If you're very deconditioned, something like a chair squat is going to be perfectly enough for you to gain strength in your legs. If you're, if you've been lifting weights for the past 40 years, you probably are going to want something that requires maybe a dumbbells or a barbell or something. So people are really varying what exercise, what form of each exercise is going to best address their goals. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I saw someone say, can you share these images with us? So we are going to send everybody um, a copy of that, all those movements after the program so that if you want to follow it at home, feel free to do so. Um, uh, and my okay, next question. question. But I'll wait till question time. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a question for Polly, but I'll wait. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. And um, Heidi, which nutrients do you most often see patients coming into you not having enough of? Um, again, it's so, it's so varied. There, there are so, you know, we live in this sort of diet. We were talking about this ahead of time a little bit about, you know, canceled diet culture. And so people are on all these extremes. Like we are in this culture where both um, paleo and vegan are, are trending just, you know, they're both popular and they could obviously not be more different from each other. So I would say that it's really just fi people figuring out how to eat to maintain their weight and to live as opposed to diet. And with that, there's so many different things that they can be off of. But again, I'd have to come back to saying that it is, um, probably protein pacing, this idea of having protein at every meal and not saving it up. So again, you might eat oatmeal in the morning thinking, oh, that's really good and, and nutritious, which, which it is, but there's no real protein in that. Or, you know, special K with, I shouldn't say it's brand name, but like a, a, a cereal with milk thinking it's enough, you know, and when you're, when you're young and you drink a glass of milk, all that goes to building, you know, look at, you know, young adolescent boys, they don't, it does, they could be eating horribly and they still, are, are developing, right? And as we get older, we have this anabolic resistance. So I'd say the protein um, fiber, uh, we need about, most Americans get between 11 and 14 grams of fiber, and we need to have anywhere from 20 
five to 30 grams of fiber. Um, so a good source of fiber is really two or more grams, which means that every meal really trying to get two or three good sources of fiber. Um, which is one reason why whole grains is so important and not limiting your carbs, you know, not eliminating carbs because carbohydrate foods are where fiber is found. It's not in protein foods, um, nuts and seeds and, and fruits and um, vegetables and whole grains. So I'd say that those are probably three key nutrients I think people don't really get enough of. Um, and one more would be really um, for your gut health which the microbiome is, you know, I, I think everybody is aware of it now, but getting in, whether it's fermented foods or again, those fiber, high fiber foods, which help to um, feed your gut microbiome the, the, to, to create that good bacteria that we need to stay healthy. And it's related to so many things, like even our ability to absorb calcium goes down to how healthy is our gut. Um, so I think those would be the, the top of the list. All right, awesome, thank you. And um, kind of in that same respect, what nutrients and foods are key for bone health, especially with people with osteopenia or osteoporosis? Um, what, what foods would you recommend for them? So to begin with, they actually need adequate calories. You know, as we get older, we do break down um, more rapidly than we're building up our bone. And osteoporosis is often really a pediatric disease that manifests later in life. But no matter what our age, we want to try to stop the um, how rapidly we're breaking down and maintain what we have. And so if you're not getting in enough calories, it's hard to do that. Protein as well. We have so much emphasis on calcium and we do for sure need to have adequate calcium because if you're not taking in adequate calcium, we're going to dig into our bone bank and take more calcium out of our bone to maintain other functions in our body. Um, so that's one reason why dairy is, you know, people, um, some people think that avoiding dairy, it's kind of a popular thing now, and you don't have to have dairy. You can get it from non-dairy sources, but for example, a cup of milk is 300 milligrams. We need 1300. If you are somebody, you know, other countries um, like Asian countries where they might have more fish that have bones in them. You know, if you're doing that, you can get a lot of calcium like sardines, but that's just not our culture. That's not what people are really doing. So they eliminate dairy and they don't substitute non-dairy sources to get calcium in. Um, dark leafy greens, broccoli and kale have calcium. Again, fish like salmon or sardines that have the bones in them. And then there's fortified products as well. Um, and some of the non-dairy uh, beverages out there are fortified, which is kind of like taking a supplement. Um, magnesium. And we're going to hear all these foods are the same foods we need for lots of different things. So avocados, nuts, beans, seeds, leafy greens, bananas, um, vitamin K. Um, and then fitness and strength is usually important to maintain our, our bones and the strength of our bones and our balance so we don't fall. You know, I think to Polly's point, a lot of us who are like into fitness, you know, balance exercises don't seem difficult enough. Like we're not sweating, but they're so crucial, especially, you know, you have to think of what we're doing now is determining our vitality 10 years from now. Would you, would you agree with that, Polly? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. It's like, you know, none of us, you know, get better with balance as we age. It's like all the things that give you your balance, your inner ear, your receptors on your joints, which may be a little arthritic and your vision, all those things that tell you where you are in space are a little dimmed <laughs> as we start to get older. And so it's, um, it's important to train those just like you would train any other part of you. Right, okay. Um, and Polly, can you speak on exercises for someone who is 50 plus looking to strengthen, whether it's strengthening their bones or strengthening their muscles, um, good movements sure. for that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, really anything, whether it's your heart, you have to stress that to get it stronger. So that's, you know, aerobic exercise. Muscles, you have to apply weights to and move the muscle through its range of motion under load. But what do bones respond to? Bones respond really two ways. One is, is the pull of the muscle on it. So the, you know, the tendon attaches the muscle to the bone. And if you, as that tendon pulls on that bone, 
it stimulates the bone to get a little stronger. Um, the other way your bone gets stronger, bones get stronger, is from ground reaction forces. So that's things like, you know, jumping and landing or the, your body weight hitting the ground. Um, so the way to, to specifically strengthen your bones is to apply a force to those bones that's a little greater than that to which it's accustomed to in the course of a day. Now that's going to vary for people. So for example, if you were a very frail person who very deconditioned with osteoporosis, walking may be plenty for ground reaction force. Um, you know, something like a push up off the wall might be plenty of, of, of pull on to develop bone density to prevent loss of bone in the wrists or getting up and down out of your chair with your own body weight several times might be enough. Now, if you're somebody else, we're talking about the range of, of fitness in women, you know, particularly affected by this, but, um, you know, a very foot fit woman who might have like osteopenia or moving into osteoporosis might need to be doing, you know, might need running or jumping to apply enough ground reaction force or, um, you know, strength training with, with weights and that sort of stuff. So it really depends on, on where you're at. And I think the thing about the right exercise is really being honest with where you're at to start out with um, because your body adapts to a stress and for some people, a relatively insignificant thing might be way too much of a stress that um, somebody else would need quite a bit more to, to elicit a response. So it really is taking, taking an honest um, you know, assessment of where you're at and always start easy. Like make sure you can do these movements appropriately with like you can squat appropriately with your body weight before you're adding weight. Make sure you can, you know, you can raise your arms overhead before you're putting a weight in them. You know, if you have shoulder issues or back issues, you always want to make sure that you can do a movement pattern correctly and without pain before you load it. So regardless of what the actual exercise is, um, it's important to make sure you can do it well and then gradually add resistance um, to strengthen your bones and your muscles um, as far as impact forces, again, walking can be fine for some, or just simply stepping off a step, going downstairs is a form of ground reaction force too, for people who need a little and are not really going to be running and jumping. But there's many ways to introduce a little ground reaction force and stimulus to your bones without getting hurt. So really form, that, that idea of form of really, it's not speed, uh, right. it's form over speed. Yeah, exactly. Right. You have to like right. You have to be making sure that you can do it correctly with control before you, you know, apply additional force to any movement. And that's true for and any motion. motion. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's just that those of us on the other side of 50 have a little less wiggle room to do things with poor form. You know, it just bites you. That's the injury. That's let's yeah. Say, yeah, <laughs> yeah. For, for injury. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I find, you know, when you take classes with people who are younger, you're, it's tempting if, you know, because yeah. often they're, they're, they're not necessarily stressing form and they're going quickly. And right. So you might just have to slow it down. Right. And I think to your point, Heidi, also about younger, uh, I think in many cases, balance exercises have become these like Cirque du Soleil things. People are standing on balls and half balls, like literally stand on one foot and brush your teeth. It's not that complicated. You know, do like stand on one foot and try to close your eyes. Like you, li you don't live on a on a ball. You live on ground. So work on, um, you know, your being able to control your center of gravity. You know, when you're moving over a planted leg or when you're just standing still, trying to you know pick up something off your desk and standing on one leg, uh, looking in different directions, standing on one leg. It doesn't have to be complicated, and it doesn't have to involve all types of equipment. You know, balance is very simple and doesn't take a lot of time. Just and that you know. is when people tend to it's when they're looking, they're walking with a coffee cup yeah. and looking over right. there, and that's yeah. right. So so those kind of reenacting sort of real life scenarios right. is what's really gonna help you being able to correct yourself from a fall. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Have to correct yourself from a fall. Mm -hmm. So Polly, doing that kind of standing on one leg, that can help to increase your stability as well if you're someone that's prone to falls. Yeah. Um, is there any other, you know, movement that you would suggest for someone that really has stability issues? Well, I think generally when people are really, you know, having stability issues, and, and this is often, 
Um, sometimes it has to do with to what Heidi was speaking about losing muscle mass and being a little frail. Sometimes, I mean, you know, I've worked with a couple of people who had chemotherapy that left them with neuropathy. So they had very little feeling in their feet, which is where we get a lot of our feedback about where we are in space. Um, so, you know, people are really very unsteady to start out with. I usually have them hold on to the back of a chair and then just take the one foot off the ground and just try to put like their fingers on the back of the chair and then take one finger away and just kind of work their way up to being able to stand on one foot, not, you know, before they try to do something a little more challenging. Um, you just want to get that single leg stability. I, okay, I can do this. I can stand on one leg. As people get more comfortable on one leg, you can have them do like keep turning their heads, that sort of thing. Or some, when you start getting a little more, you know, advance, you know, bend over, tap your knee and then reach your arms overhead. So you're moving over your planted leg a little bit um, or walk tandem, heel, toe, heel, toe, heel, toe down a hall. I wouldn't start somebody who's really unsteady doing that without somebody next to them because obviously you're challenging their ability to balance and you want them to have um, a way to, you know, catch themselves should they not be able to maintain their balance. But there's lots of ways just in your own home that you can, you um, really effectively work on balance um, and make it safe by just making sure that you have things to hold on to should you need it or somebody's there to grab their arm if you need it. All right, great. And Heidi, I'm going to throw in a question that's coming into the Q&A because I know you mentioned it earlier. Um, a couple people were wondering what kind of foods can I eat to improve my gut health? Um, well, really fiber is one of the most important things. They become sort of prebiotic that feed your probiotics. Of course, there's fermented foods, which goes back to yogurt in our culture. Yes, you can get, you know, there are other like real sauerkraut. It's just that that's not so popular in our culture. And there certainly are those who reach out for it, kimchi. And um, so there are in every culture, there seems to be some fermented food that's that's popular. So, so fermented, but for us, you know, having a yogurt every day, which helps your bone health as well, you know, cause you're getting calcium and you're getting protein. And then you're also um, getting those good, healthy bacteria to feed your microbiome. All right, great. Um, and Polly, I have another question for you. Can you recommend some exercises that are low impact? And some of these might be the things you talked about earlier. Um, but low impact for people with knee pain or joint pain? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, some of the things like Pilates is a great form of exercise is low impact. Um, swimming, certainly any water exercise, whether it's swimming, water aerobics, you know, anything like that is, is very low impact and great for your joints is with, you know, very forgiving. It supports your joints. Most people feel very good in the water. Um, Cycling, rowing, um, you know, all these kinds of, of exercises can be low impact uh, walking. But I think more importantly, um, to address the joint and knee pain, um, you know, is there something that can be done? Is that a matter of, of um, some strength training for the muscles around the joint that might make you be able to do things with a little less pain? Certainly things like, um, you know, we looked at that chair squat in those slides somebody, people who are doing squatting exercises, if they have knee pain, you know, they don't want, generally arthritic knees don't tolerate deep squats really well, um, in which points to like Heidi's point about going to classes with a lot of young people, like dropping down into a deep squat, deep flexion of joints when they're a little arthritic is sometimes not well tolerated. But, um, as I said, I think arthritic joints, um, there's a lot of times where you could have arthritis in a joint, but it doesn't really bother you because the muscles surrounding that joint are really strong and they hold the joint in good alignment. So you're much more likely to have pain in a joint if it's, if it's not really lined up well. So if we think about what we've all been doing these past few months of sitting forward over computers, there are a lot of people with their shoulders bothering them because their, their arm bone is kind of sitting in the front of that shoulder instead of back where it should be. So if they go to reach their arm overhead or reach forward, it's kind of jamming that joint. So if you had, let's say a little arthritis in your shoulder, it's gonna feel way worse if, you're, if you've got the joint in a terrible position. And similarly for you know, a knee, if, you're, if when you walk or stand on one leg, your hip muscles are weak and it lets the knee kind of collapse inward instead of being directly lined up over your, ideally your hip, your knee, and your ankle are one straight line, like a stop, you know, like a, 
um, stoplight. Um, and if, if the knee's sort of pointing in one direction and the foot's pointing in another and the hip's going in another, none of those joints are going to be very happy. They need to work as a team. And that has to do with often things like, you know, exercises for your hips or stretching, stretching your calves so that you can move with enough mobility to not go into those bad, those, those vulnerable positions. So that's what you know, sort of goes back to the pyramid, like, take a look at that. Are you, do you have enough mobility? Do you have enough strength? And then those type of things should allow you to do a little bit more with less pain over time. If you sort of address the building blocks of what supports the joint, that's the one that's vulnerable. Okay, thanks. And, and so Polly, also to your point, and to the person who's asking, which is great, is, you know, I think is, as we age and we start having more pains, aches and pains, it becomes, it, there's a little bit of an obstacle to, to feel motivated to exercise or to be fit because it hurt. It, we think it's going to hurt more, right. but there right. isn't anything where exercise doesn't actually help it. Right. right. Exactly. Like you will get, you might have to modify a little bit, but there isn't any, anything, no matter how, what you have really where exercise, finding the right exercise isn't going to actually be helpful. In the long term, again, the, cur the right dose of it's like it's like a you know exercise is the most powerful drug you could give somebody um, in the right dose. So you want to make sure you know just like any any medicine in the wrong dose or the wrong medicine is going to make somebody sick. Same thing with exercise. You're you know if you have arthritic knees and you're having people do like deep squats and jumps and you know all this kind of stuff, like you're probably going to make their knees hurt a little bit. But um, but there's many ways to to, a, to find an exercise prescription that is going to help you um, move with less pain. So that sometimes involves going to see a physical therapist um, or a clinical exercise physiologist doesn't require a prescription from a physician. And then they are you know, trained exercise professionals with backgrounds in kinesiology and so forth that can, can help people sort of discover you know, an exercise program that is appropriate for whatever their particular issues might be, whether that's arthritis, whether it's heart disease, you know, whatever it might be, um, that you find an exercise dose that is actually helpful to you um, in, in your overall health and um, quality of life. And ability to do more each day. Yeah. What about, um, do you mind me asking a question, Bonnie? Yeah, go for it. So, <laughs> What, what about this idea of recovery as we get older and that, like how many days should we be moving or how intensely or how much time does it take to recover between sessions? Does that change as we get older? Yeah, I mean, it generally takes longer to recover from, um, it's, you know, I think it's important to, to remember that you, you can still adapt even when you're older. So you can still get stronger, you can still gain mobility, all those things that I think sometimes people feel like, you know, um, you know, you can't build muscle or you can't, you're always going to, it's not going to be the same. It's going to take a little longer, but you can see progress. They've done studies of people in nursing homes that gain tremendous amount of strength with strength training. So there is no limit to your ability to improve. It just takes a little longer. Um, you know, there's been some studies of giving strength training programs to a strength training session to somebody, you know, 80 and somebody, 20 and then looking at what happens in terms of protein metabolism and muscle building. And it was really, you know, if, you, if you're, you know, it's kind of like, wow, <laughs> you are totally right about somebody, you know, a boy who's 16 just builds muscle when, you know, you have to, it's, it's going to take longer. And it also takes longer to, you know, for soreness or recovery, all that stuff, that whole process just takes a little bit longer, but it still occurs. So I think that's one of the things to be mindful of is just, it's not like you, if let's say you went out and you did a fairly strenuous workout, it's not like you don't, you can do nothing the next day. Maybe you can do some stretching, get into the pool, maybe a little yoga, a different form. If you think about those buckets of exercise, there's a million different ways to do it. One day you strength train, another day you do cardio, another day you're going to focus on mobility, another day let's just do some balance exercises. So there's really always something you can be doing to move the needle um, and without without exacerbating a pre-existing issue. All right, great. Um, I'm gonna take it back to you, Heidi. Uh, which foods would you recommend that people avoid? I know there's a lot of, you know, foods are almost demonized today. Like, don't eat that, don't eat that, you know. 
Um, but what would you recommend people don't eat in order to maintain that good health, especially when they're trying to stay active? Yeah, that's not really my philosophy toward <laughs> food and well-being. I'm, I'm much more into focusing on what foods are really good to include that promote health and well-being um, as opposed to truly avoiding foods. You know, let's remember food is nourishing, but it is also pleasure. It's also celebratory and it's... Um, you know, there's a culture to it. And so I, I, it's not, I don't think we should be feeling guilt and um, shame around food and making it a moral issue, you know, like, oh, I'm so bad. I ate a cookie, you know, like I'm not good or bad because I ate a cookie. It's just a cookie, you know, get on with your day. So, but clearly, you know, that, um, you know, the new dietary guidelines just came out. And again, sugar is that when we talk about food being villainized, I don't think we need to villainize it. But of course, there are certain foods we want to build our core diet around, which are all the same fruit foods, you know, fruits, vegetables, protein, um, you know, good, healthy fats, you know, all of those foods we keep hearing about. And it doesn't mean it's not an all or none. So like if you like red meat, you can have red meat, but maybe have it three times a week is the recommendation, not, you know, three times a day. And if you, you know, if you enjoy, if you like sweets, have sweets, but it's about 10%, seven to 10% of your calories. So if you need 2000 calories a day, that's 200 calories. Not that I'm suggesting you have to really count calories, but the idea is, so you want a cookie, you know, have a cookie. And if you want, if you like m and so you had a cookie today, save your m ms for tomorrow. You want an ice cream the next day, you have it the next day. You don't have to have it all today. And if you don't do this all or none thinking, like I can't have it, and then you have it, and then you feel bad you have it, and then you swear you're not going to have it. And then you have, you know, like that kind of negative thing gets you more in there. Like if I tell you right now for the next 10 seconds, don't think about cookies. Go. What do you think like about? <laughs> right. So I'm not much into telling you what not to and as opposed to, you know, again, like fruits get fruit gets villainized. It's like nature's way of getting us energy and vitamins and, and phytonutrients. And I mean, it's it's packed in there. That's how we get energy. So I don't understand some of the villainized foods, especially when it's good whole food that you can recognize and see, you know, but you don't really have to fear food. Just you, you know, the foods that are not as nutritious, you have in less amounts, less often. Right. It's all about that balance. It That's the key. Seems, you know, it seems like very cliche, but um, I think that diet culture and, and like there are people I see who are still doing diet, you know, dieting and off limit foods. And they're just so stuck in that, that it takes away um, space from their life. So you know, yeah. So, I mean, we all know we don't need to eat as much fried foods or, you know, don't have to have pastries and, you know, like, like you don't need me to tell you that, but it doesn't mean you can't have it. Like there's a difference between restriction and inhibition. Inhibition is saying like, okay, that was enough. I'll have more tomorrow. Restriction is I can't have that. And there isn't anything you can't have. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm going to have a cookie tonight. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, somebody asked, can you talk a little bit about caloric intake um when should you eat and how many calories do you need before and after exercise so part of that depends on what you're doing right how when you ate before what when you're exercising like first thing in the morning you know if you're going on a walk you don't really necessarily need to fuel for that but if you're doing more intense um, I am a firm believer in 15 to 25 grams of easy to digest carbohydrates. So that's a few pretzels that might be, um, that might be, uh, a, you know, a, a, like some applesauce or something just quick and easy that gets in your system. You don't have to have a full breakfast, but if you're going to go take a spin class, or you're going to go and work out harder. You're going to go lift weights. It is good to have some fuel in your system. Um, it will help you actually be able to work harder. Um, but if you're doing something very light and easy, then you don't nearly need to. And if you're exercising at lunch and you've had breakfast or a snack, then you don't need to fuel for that. But if you're exercising after work and you ate lunch at 12 and work is at, you know, you're not exercising till six, you've gone six hours, it's going to be like eight hours, then have an afternoon snack that will fuel your workout. 
Um, so it, again, it just sort of depends on where it is in the day. Um, after the same thing, you know, there, it is true that recovery does help. Um, you know, having protein with some carbohydrate after your workout can be helpful with this muscle protein synthesis. Um, so any, but it depends again, who you are, you know, anywhere 15 grams, anywhere from as little as seven to 20 grams of protein. Um, and that could be from a yogurt or a protein shake. Like it doesn't have to be proprietary. If you're eating your dinner, let's say again, or your breakfast right after your workout, that is your recovery. If you're going to, if it's in the afternoon and you're going to wait a few hours until you eat, then you want to have a recovery, a more specific designated kind of recovery snack. So, you know, it's hard generally, but the, that's the general guidelines. Okay. All right. And Polly, um, what exercise errors do you often see? So kind of what things should we really avoid doing when we're exercising or what form mistakes just to avoid injury? Um, well, I would say the, the most common are the terrible twos. Too much, too soon, too frequently, too hard. Like, you know, people are like, I'm going to, you know, there's like a 5K coming up. I'm going to do it. So they get out and they run every day, every day, every day. And then, oh, wow, my knees are killing me. Um, so I think, you know, again, sort of understanding a little balance in what you're doing. Um, thinking about your people sometimes will set a goal for whatever it may be. Often it's a sports related goal. But understanding, like, for example, going running a 5K. You need to train to run. You don't run to get into shape. You get into shape to run. So running is basically jumping from one leg to the other. If you can't stand on one leg, you're probably going to have trouble running a lot and without getting hurt. Um, can you stand on one leg? Can you jump from one leg to the other and maintain good alignment? Do you have the right shoes on? Do you have, you have enough mobility? Do you have enough core strength? Do you have good posture? Like all these things that go into being able to run without pain are strength flexibility, single leg stability, like all the things on that pyramid allow you to the top of the pyramid, which is running. So I think, again, just being mindful of building to whatever it is you want to do systematically. Let's say you do want to start doing, you know, running. Well, the first time you go out, you don't run for 30 minutes. You walk and then jog for a few minutes and then walk and so forth. So I think, you know, that's that what what gets people into trouble is they see, you know, I want to take this high intensity class and I haven't exercised in a year or I want to do, you know, they have some idea of what they want to do and they just there are steps to get there safely um, and really assessing where am I at right now and following that, you know, building from where you're at in a very systematic way. The other thing that is, you know, guaranteed to make people's joints hurt is doing things with your joint in a compromised position. So again, you know, if your knee is collapsing in, if your shoulders are forward and you're shoving weights over your head, your shoulders are going to kill you eventually. If you're lifting with poor form, your back is going to bother you. So proper form is really the key to being able to do any exercise with the least amount of risk of ending up injured. So um, you know, if you think about poor form and repeating it over and over and over under load in a weight room or on the roads running, if you're this poor form and you're just doing a million repetitions of that with load on the joint, it's going to be tough not to have like your tendon hurt or your knee or your joint hurt or, you know, something sooner or later starting to act up. So really understanding ideal form and whatever exercise you're doing. And um, that may be involve, you know, having a session with, um, an exercise physiologist or a, or a qualified trainer to really go over proper form in the weight room or with common exercises. But generally that is the best thing you could do for yourself is, is understand how to do things with proper form. Okay, great. That's a great tip. Um, and for Heidi, do you have any tips for making healthy eating easier, um, especially people that are super busy? And I know that somebody in the questions asked, you know, I want to keep a healthy lifestyle, but my spouse or partner doesn't. Can I, how can I get them involved? How can I get them into it? And, you know, just easy tips for making those healthy meals. Who asked that question? Yeah, that comes from my husband. <laughs> so I, I live in a house where we all have very different um, food preferences. Um, and 
I, I want to go back and um, it's funny. I think he asked that. So first of all, I do think that looking at your day as as basic as this seems, the truth is that planning makes things easier. Like if you have no plan, it's hard not to eat on the defensive, meaning like now you're hungry and there's nothing around you're going to eat whatever, you know, that's when you're, you're going to eat whatever is there. So I do think understanding what your day looks like ahead and knowing whether you're going to stop for lunch, whether you're, you know, if you're at work, what you're going to bring to lunch, what you have in your fridge um, and, and planning ahead. Um, I like to encourage people to focus again, more on what to eat and what not to eat, to create a pattern of eating, like not to get stuck in a schedule or get stuck, at, like they have to eat this perfect, like, like don't worry about perfection. You don't have to eat perfectly to eat healthily, but have a pattern of eating, which is sort of the Mediterranean style of eating. You know, the mind diet, the dash diet, these are all patterns of eating that aren't so prescriptive, but include a wide range of foods that you can pretty much get anywhere. And, you know, it's very, it's very sort of simple, you know, you have a quarter of your plate is protein and then it's fruits, vegetables, color, and then it's that starchy, a quarter of starch. And so whether that's a sandwich with some side or whether it's a stir fry or, you know, whether it's a burrito, like there's lots of different ways that can look. Um, and focus on health, not on weight. When we focus on weight, it takes us away from really paying attention to our internal cues of hunger and fullness. And it takes us, it becomes again, way more restrictive. When we focus on health, it's a much better sort of um, just way to, of self-care. It's like if we switch that narrative, it, it's kind of freeing and it, and it, makes, it, it, it makes eating well, not such a burden. Right. All right. Thank you. And I ignored my husband's question about how to, how to pull your head. <laughs> <laughs> <That's laughs> okay. He eats what he wants, I eat what I want. <laughs> You're happy, happy. That's all that matters. <laughs> um, are there any foods, Heidi, that are proven to have potential benefits for older adults or even slow signs of aging? Yeah, so the MIND diet is a relatively new diet that really did try to tease out, you know, there's again the DASH diet, which is the dietary advances to stop hypertension. So that really looks to, and very well studied, um, you know, research to support how, what foods to eat to lower hypertension and the Mediterranean diet, which we know is good for um, heart health. Um, and also the mind, but, but the mind diet is sort of this mashup of these two. And it looks at um, the frequency and the types of foods that we eat. So green leafy vegetables specifically, um, six or more servings a week. So that's once a day, having something green leafy pretty much. It doesn't matter if you miss a day, right? Again, it's not perfect. Um, kale, spinach, all different kinds of cooked greens. Um, other leafy vegetables, other vegetables are also important, but at least those green leafies once a day. Berries specifically, again, all fruits are good, but berries specifically do seem to have at least, and we're only talking about twice a week, right? So it's, you know, and these are foods I find people like, but they don't necessarily always have. It's not like most people don't go, oh, I hate them. They go, yeah, I like them, but then you look and they, they just maybe weeks before they've had it. So you can keep frozen berries. Like again, be convenient. It doesn't have to be fresh, frozen works. So twice, even twice a week, um, nuts, um, which is, I mean, again, these foods are on every kind of really nutritious, it's not, it's not a big secret, but you know, an ounce of nuts, um, which is just like a handful, more days than not, five days a week, more days than not. Um, olive oil is a popular, is, is on the mind diet. And again, on the Mediterranean diet, so uh, all the, it's consistent, whole grains, three, three servings a day, fish at least once a week, even for the mind diet, you can have it once, twice, or three times a week, but for the mind diet, only once a week seem to um, help um, beans, four meals a week, and that's in the new dietary guidelines as well to try to substitute and, and go with a plant-based meal or at least include beans a few times a week. Um, and so, you know, these are, the, these are not like crazy prescriptive, it's good healthy foods, but it is amazing because we don't have any good medications right now. There is no real way to, um, to prevent, um, uh, you know, dementia and, and Alzheimer's. And by following the MIND diet, it was shown that if people who really did follow this, this 
plan and these types of foods, we're able to, by seven years, reduce, um, reduce some of the symptoms and signs of, um, in all different ways in which it was sort of scored uh, for memory and cognitive health. So it's really actually impressive research. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure that's really valuable for people listening who want to start planning out what they're going to eat. Um, <laughs> but we only have a couple more minutes. Um, let's do one more question. I think that this one could apply to both of you. Someone wants to know how to gain weight in a healthy way. So I know Polly, maybe you, it could help to gain weight through strengthening exercises. Right, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, putting on muscle mass is always a good idea. And um, certainly as we age, um, that's gonna allow you to you know, live independently, basically if, to be strong enough to get up yourself up off the floor and get out of chairs and lift things and move things that, you know, your, your cardiovascular endurance and your strength are the keys to independent living. So um, putting on weight um, by strength training, you know, two to three times a week in order to really gain muscle, you need to be doing it, you know, fairly regularly. So if you're doing strength training, maybe once a week, you can, you can maintain the strength you have, but if you want to gain strength, you're going to need to be doing that more. Um, and that would be minimum twice a week and more likely, you know, three or four times a week. Um, and then in addition to applying the stimulus for your muscle to get stronger and grow, you need to be putting the stuff into your body <laughs> that is going to be the building blocks of those muscles. And that's where, where Heidi's protein, um, you know, putting it through the course of your day is going to maximize your chances of having it available when you apply that stimulus to the muscle. And it's like, man, we got to get a little stronger. And oh, by the way, here's some protein. Let's put it into this muscle and, and build it back a little stronger. So other tips, you know, part of the challenge is as people get older, their taste buds might change, their sense of smell might change, um, denture, wearing teeth, you know, there's lots of different things, economics, social, being alone, you know, there's lots of different things that affect our appetite and our access to food. But some of the general sort of guidelines for weight gain is to, um, because there's only so much that people can eat at one meal, um, is to actually just make sure you eat more frequently. So even if it's, a, I, I, I would prefer your meals not be smaller, eat as much as you can, but then eat more often because that's another opportunity to get calories in. Protein, yes, is crucially important as we said, but you do need those calories. So eat more frequently. And then it's sort of all of the recommendations that everyone hears about weight loss, it's the opposite. So instead of drinking water, have fruit juice so that it's caloric or chocolate milk, right? And have your liquids at the end of the meal. So you don't fill up, you know, one of the tricks to weight loss is to have, you know, salad or soup or beverage first to sort of take a little edge off your hunger, but you don't want to take the edge off your hunger. So have it at the end of the meal. And then instead of going with those volumetric, the high water content foods, you want to get really nutrient uh, or calorically packed foods. So have, you know, like banana bread and muffins, make sure you, you know, do go heavier on the starches, not making sure you get in your protein, but go ahead and, you know, dip that bread in olive oil, put olive oil on your pasta before you put tomato sauce. Cause that, you know, fats are more calorically dense nuts and seeds. If you, if you can have it. So there's just lots of tricks that you can really do. And, um, and it takes, it takes effort. It doesn't, it, it is like people, you know, so many people go, oh, I would need to lose, but it, it is, it's a challenge to put on weight. Definitely. All right. So while we are closing out, um, can I ask from you too, if you want people to take away one or two things from this lecture um, to change their diet, change their exercise for the better, um, what would you, what would you say are your parting words? Well, for mine, I, I just want, I would, I want people to think about fitness. Just remember that pyramid. Fitness is, is a lot of different things. And I think that's one thing people, they kind of tend to do what they like. So people who are flexible do yoga. People who, you know, like to lift, spend all their time doing that. And people who just run those, you know, that doesn't necessarily build that overall fitness that is going to take you through your life with, with the ability to move well, without pain, do the things you want to do. Um, and I think to Heidi's 
description of these varied diets, it's the same thing with your exercise. You need to be addressing all those different components. Um, you're always going to have ones that you like more than others, but by including a little attention to your strength, to your flexibility, to your postural alignment, your balance, and your cardiovascular fitness, those are going to help you lead the life that you envision for yourself as long as possible with um, vigor and um, no painful joints and backs and so forth. That's really what's the key is to being fit. Yeah, I, I, I just feel like I'll be repetitive is to expand your choices, don't narrow them. The more, the, the greater range of foods that you can take in, the more likely you're going to get in the nutrients you need. Um, you know, do be thoughtful without being phobic about getting in, you know, they're basic foods that are core to our diet and our well-being. And if you're getting those foods in, you don't have to worry so much about, first of all, you'll be full and satisfied and less likely to, um, you know, be doing all of those, other, you know, eating so much of those other foods that, that, that people are concerned about, but um, really just, just uh, focus in on, on, on the, on the sort of core foods that are in every healthy research, well studied, as opposed to like fad diets and uh, food and fitness will get you there, right? Great. Father used to say, if you eat, if you eat well until you know, it, it used to say if you eat hot dogs. If you eat hot dogs until you're hundred, you'll live a long time. Every day until you're hundred, you'll live a long life. <laughs> Just keep going. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much to Heidi and Polly for being our speakers today. That was great. Um, that's all we have time for today. Um, but thanks thank for having us and thanks for coming. Yeah. 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 Really thank you everyone for thanks tuning time. in. And if you have any other questions, I know we didn't get to every single one. Um, you can email us at pped at hss.edu. Um, and we're going to be posting this recording on YouTube. So we'll send everybody that. Um, and for more content on overall wellness, our, our YouTube channel.